Um, hi, thanks everyone for coming out this evening to honor Richard Reinhardt. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the San Francisco Mechanics Institute. Uh, my work here involves coordinating our writers' activities, something uh, which Mr. Reinhardt has been very supportive of during his tenure as a trustee. Currently, we have 13 writers' groups meeting virtually, free talks on the writing business twice a month, and several writers' classes planned for the fall. So if that floats your boat, I encourage you to check out our website to see what is coming up. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, um, the, the oldest in fact designed to serve the public in California, a world renowned chess club and a very rich calendar of cultural events. Right now, due to the shelter in place, all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us it's only $120 a year and support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> this evening's conversation will include our board president, Lindsay Crittenden, and another stalwart uh, board member, Mark Pinto. We also have with us our executive, directory, executive director, Kimberly Scrafano. Um, so questions will be taken at the end of the talk. So please post them in the chat space and my colleague and I and my colleague Pam Troy and I will try and answer as many as we can. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you Richard for your 22 years of service uh, for the Mechanics Institute. Now let me hand over the mic to Lindsay Crittenden and Mark Pinto. Thanks so much Taryn. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and to welcome all of you tonight to this conversation with local writer and long-term friend and trustee of the Mechanics Institute, Richard Reinhardt. Mark Pinto, another long-term trustee, will join me and the three of us are going to have what promises to be an interesting and, and uh, wide-ranging conversation about writing and about the writing process and Dick's life as a writer. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of brief biography. I know that many of you are familiar with Dick, know his work, know him personally. Um, Dick was born in Oakland and educated at Stanford. He has traveled overseas as a traveling scholar with Columbia University and as a recipient of a Ford Fellowship for Near East Studies. He's the author of several books, both historical fiction and nonfiction including The Ashes of Smyrna, Out West on the Overland Train, Treasure Island, San Francisco's Exposition Years, and four books, $300 and a Dream about our own Mechanics Institute. Uh, a reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle for, for several years, a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, and director of nonfiction writing at the Squaw Valley Community of Writers. Dick has an avid interest in historical preservation and travel and has been an active member of San Francisco's literary world, not to mention the Mechanics Institute um, for more than half a century. So I'd like to start, Dick, by asking you, as someone growing up in the first half of the 20th century, a time of great change, like now, in different ways. What propelled you to start writing? When did writing become for you an interest and then a real career vocation? Well, that's an easy question because I started wanting to be a writer from the time I mastered the alphabet and began writing in little books. Uh, my, first, uh, my first published book, which is because the teacher took it upon her to take down my notes, it was an, autobiograph an autobiographical treatment of my childhood, starting at about <laughs> two and getting through about seven at that point. <laughs> so I've always, always considered myself from the very beginning a writer. Mm. And uh, that meant trying to find in education the route where one could 
get to be a writer and still stay alive. Yes. Do you still have that little book, that little autobiography you did? I never threw anything away in my yeah. life. The <laughs> even, even the most awful first drafts. Well, and I think that says so much about the writing impulse, doesn't it? That at that young age, you would, you would feel the need, you would feel the real desire to, to record. You know, I think writers are born observing and noticing the world around them. And even at that young age, you, you felt that need um, so strongly to, that you needed to record it down and your teacher, your teacher saw something there. So that's really wonderful. Um, did you study writing at school? Did you, did you start writing after college? When did you start writing for a paycheck, so to speak? <laughs> Uh, the, the paycheck came with a few freelance articles uh, when I was in the in the uh, Graduate School of Journalism in Columbia. <laughs> Pardon me. And uh, that, of course, gave me a little sense of what it might be like to be a freelance writer because one is paid very, very little. This is one reason why so many writers, in fact, are also teachers or lucky enough spouses of someone who will support them or have some other means of paying the bills. It's very, very difficult. And I think there were many of the people who were very fine professional writers teaching at San Francisco State, for example, teaching at Squaw Valley, teaching at UC Berkeley, who must supplement their living with teaching or something of that kind. Teaching is wonderful for the teacher, but it sort of saps uh, the energies of the writer in many ways because you have to try not to become an editor of your, of your students. It's not going to do them any good if you move in on them and try to crush their writing impulse with your own. That's interesting that, that, that you use the word crush for editing because I am, I am also a writer and a teacher, as many of you may know, and I had a conversation with a student just the other day and I was suggesting a revision to him and he said, is that editing? And it really did make me stop and think there, there's a tremendous difference between revision and editing and how did you... How did you come to do that? How as a teacher did you, did you uh, come to you know, restrain that hand that not necessarily wanted to impose your own style? I don't think a good teacher would ever want to do that, but you know, to, to, to make it, perhaps make a suggestion or how did you learn to really help them find their own voice? Well, I taught in two different forms. I taught journalism at University of California, Berkeley. I enjoyed this immensely because students at that age, college age, some of them were working on the, in the uh, uh, in publications at UC Berkeley. And it was thrilling to work with them as journalists. I didn't attempt very much to, to impose style upon anybody or say, I wish you, you could sound a little different than you do. Because they had, the journalist has his own or her own voice, frequently is suppressed unless it becomes a kind of a journalistic memoir, which is something more like, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to try to name names because it would be it would be pejorative. But many journalists get their reputation, but really by intervening, which is just as well, I think. When I came to begin to write fiction, I probably made the mistake of going into writing historical fiction because it meant I had to try to move myself into the minds of people long dead. And uh, fortunately, I decided to take a course where I was going to be really doing an awful lot of research before I wrote, so that I would be, it would make me feel safe 
about what I was writing, that I was not going to be making terrible mistakes. Sure. That's probably not the best way to write fiction either. I don't know. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And will you write fiction as well? Well, I've never written historical fiction. So, I mean, my fiction is placed in, in, in this world. You know, it's, I don't write uh, science fiction or fantasy. <laughs> but I've never written about um, real life figures. So when you say you, you wrote about people who had long since died in the ashes of Smyrna, were those characters actual living people? I mean, certainly the politicians you wrote about were, I would imagine, but were your characters actual people that you did research on or had you, or did you make them up? Well, the characters were all creations. Yeah, uh, I did yeah. have the good fortune of being able to interview both uh, Turks and Greeks who had lived through the experience I was writing about. For many of them, it was very difficult uh, that they felt I was perhaps touching areas that were almost too difficult to recall. For example, one man who had been a colonel in the Greek army and was trying to remember for me what it was like to be virtually imprisoned in a, in a winter uh, siege where the Turkish army had surrounded a portion of the Greek army. And for him to be able to talk about it was, was perhaps more helpful to me than it was for him. Mm -hmm. But he did recall in great retail forms of suffering and forms of fear and so forth that, that I then knew I was on the right ground if the characters that I had manufactured, which included Greek and Turkish people, were within the scope of my own imagination to imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think all fiction writers draw on, you know, our, we, we draw on our own experience. We draw on people we've known. We draw on conversations we've had, observations we've made, whether we, whether we directly are putting, you know, Aunt Martha on the page or not, where we're maybe taking a bit of Aunt Martha and a bit of, you know, Cousin Phoebe or, you know, as well as making a great deal up. I, for me, I think this, the, the challenge with historical fiction, um, I've done, I've always written first and then done the research. For example, if I have a character who is a archeologist and I know very little about archeology, span I will get about as far as I can get and I'll realize I need to do some research. I need to know what this person who's sent to Nevada, for example, what tools she would have with her, what, what, what her assignment would be. <laughs> she'd be looking for and that kind of research or if i'm writing a um, a scene that takes place in a garden in the spring i want to make sure i have the right thing in bloom so <laughs> something like that um but i would imagine your experience <coughs> living in the near east i mean i'm assuming you lived in the near east um you know, with the Ford Fellowship. And at that point, you that's when you must have done a lot of the on the ground research for the Ashes of Smyrna, correct? Yes. Yeah, which is about, for those who haven't read it, it's a wonderful historical novel about the, would you say the Greek occupation of Turkey after Greek joined the allies in the First World War? So it takes that's place- very close to, the, it was not the way it was described, it was, close to a mandate that mandate. the uh, peace, peace conference in 1919 had given to the Greeks because of the extreme friendship that the British people felt, especially for the then head of the, of the Greek government, Eleftherius Venizelos. If Venizelos had not been so strong a man, I think caution would have prevailed and the Greek would, Greeks would not have sent an armed force into what that part of the Ottoman Empire where the Turks ruled. Yeah. The other empire was very large. There were places where the Greeks outnumbered any other race, but where they landed, 
was not yeah. one of those places. And that meant that they put the other Greeks who were living there, that the Greek government put them into danger and ultimately resulted in the Greeks being expelled from that part of the of uh, Anatolia, the Ottoman Empire. And it was and was and is still regarded by most uh, Greek people as a tragedy. The Asia Minor catastrophe. They had hoped instead to produce a new empire, Greek speaking and so forth. And right. so what I was interested in for the subject was the contrast between winners and losers in a war, mm. apparent winners and apparent losers. I think mm. really both sides in that particular war, both Greeks and Turks lost a great deal. They had lived together rather comfortably for 500 years. Mm. And when you see one side or another reasserting themselves, this is kind of getting a little off the subject, but in the papers in the last few days, you may have seen that the Church of Ayasophia in Istanbul. Yes, has been made a mosque again. To be a mosque. Well, yeah. it was a mosque for many, many years, but before many, many years before that, it was a Christian church. So this is really a bad sign in what was the Ottoman Empire in modern Turkey, that they are returning themselves to be a strongly Islamic state and asserting what had been the triumph of modern Turkey was to become a secular state. Right, yeah. Citizenship, respect for everybody. That was about the best outcome you could have had from that war. Well, one thing that struck me in reading the book too was how much um, nostalgia, if that's the right word, pride. I mean, the Greeks have, you know, the ancient Greece is the, you know, seed of, of culture, right? The seed of democracy. So they have this enormous pride in their culture. But of course, the Turks had enormous pride in the Ottoman Empire. And, and in 1919, you know, empires were empires were quickly becoming a, a thing of the past. So that's interesting. How did you find it living over there? What was it like to live overseas as a young man? Did you have a family at well, that point? Yes. Uh, we, when we, when we, I had been to Turkey uh, and to Greece uh, before I was married. Uh, but when we had little children, then they were, it was wonderful to be with them because they were in preschool or kindergarten uh, with local children. And those became our uh, entree to meeting other parents and both of uh, in, in both in Athens and in Istanbul, we made many friends, not merely Americans, but many Greeks in Istanbul, in Athens and many Turks in Istanbul. Mm. So I came to realize that my feelings about them, which were fond in both cases, were justified, and that that it was it was indeed a, a great sadness that those people who had lived together. The, their predecessors had lived together for 500 years, had been torn apart again, as, as the war did. And now things had been healed after the war of 1919. And now it was back again to a position where fundamentalist Islamists were asserting the rights to that church, which is an international shrine. It was a, built by the Greeks, filled with beautiful mosaics. The mosaics were painted over by the sensible Turkish government that followed the war, that of Kemal Ataturk. Nothing was ruined. The mosques, which were offensive, the pictures were offensive to the to the Muslims. They were pictures of well, they um, were they Christian were representations, right? So instead of destroying them. The very sensible Turkish yeoman pasted them over. They were re entirely uh, removable, entirely uh, savable. And that was the right church, right uh, judgment to make that church not a mosque, 
but a museum, which is what it was for many, many years, now many successful years. It's a very, to me, it's a very sad thing to make it a mosque again, not because I have anything against Muslim worship, but I have a great deal of uh, feelings about how Christians will feel about Muslim worship going on and what they regarded as one of their great churches. Well, these layers, you know, like like when you go to Rome and you see these 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 churches in Rome that are on top of pagan temples. Have you been to Istanbul, Mark? Have you been to Santa Sofia? I'm sorry, I didn't follow that. I was asking Mark if he had been to Hagia Sophia, if he had seen yes. it. I'd been to Saudi, but uh, I wasn't able to go to Mecca because I'm not of that faith. But uh, I got a good sense of what it's like. So I appreciate what Richard's saying. I wanted to ask Richard about his time at Columbia. You know, when he was there, uh, New York, as we know, has a very rich literary culture. Were you able to, to socialize with some of the prominent writers at the time? In the, in the mechanics? New York, or? In New York City, at Columbia. In New York. Well, you were at Columbia. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, although I was, in, I was in a journalism school. So I was very pleased when some of my my uh, fellow students there wound up in the newspaper business or in television. Uh, I don't think there were many writers of fiction there. If they were, I apologize to them for going in that direction. They I went to the New York Post. An art dealer and <laughs> that kind of thing. This is where journalism school trades, trades you for other things. Well, was this sort of Pete Ham? Well, this would have been before Pete Hamill and, and reporters like that, right? Uh, yes, it was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> it and was not before, the only person that I later knew was Jim McClatchy of the McClatchy Newspaper Party. It was in the class ahead of me at Columbia. Uh, so they, the Columbia Journalism School was also producing publishers, advertising people, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm happy to say some very great reporters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never felt that it was essential that uh, anybody had have had to go to a J school. I thought the, the, the J school, as we always called it, was wonderful for me because I hadn't ever had any newspaper training, except you know, writing for the Highlander at Piedmont High School, that kind of thing. So, so I still feel that writing can be studied uh, and should be studied and worked at by potential writers, but that it's not something that really can be Im implanted into somebody by a school. Much as I, I think the writing classes that we're having now in the Mechanics Institute are in the right direction. They put people together with other people who care about writing. And that's, that's something that, because it's a, essentially a, a lonely profession, I think that this, one of, this is one of the really good things that the Mechanics Institute is doing nowadays and was doing when you, you and I were on the board together, Mark, many years ago. We were always interested in writing, but we've been doing a lot more at the Mechanics Institute now. Many, many little sort of self-driven self classes and certainly constant visits by writers and authors and even agents and so forth for people coming to the Mechanics Institute to meet. Yeah, well, to the extent that's a credit to you because uh, you were part of that initiative to, to expand in that direction. So the Institute owes you uh, a lot of gratitude in that respect and uh, we're appreciative of what we've done over the years. I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your your uh, time in Egypt. It was it was pre-Nasser. The British had occupied, were still occupying the Canal Zone, if, if, I'm, if I remember my history correctly. What was that like? Because uh, it was still coming out of the colonial age, and, and you know, after right after World War uh, II, you know, recent, you know, it was fairly recent, and the British and French had a big presence in the Middle East. So what was that like? We were not greatly affected by it, living in Istanbul or in Athens, except insofar as there was a, a almost continuous friction in Cyprus, 
the island that was part of the British Empire at one time, and then was occupied in different regions of the island by Turks and Greeks. Uh, unfortunately, particularly in Greece, uh, a, a, a sort of uh, irredentism that involves, we would like to have Cyprus all our own, for example. With, an, with one Archbishop Makarios pushing that to the point that it was very close to having a war between the Turks and the Greeks over Cyprus. And this was done essentially by the moving of ambitious politicians against their nearest neighbor. Because basically the Turks and the Greeks have a great deal in common, common history and their, their cultures, their agricultural and business cultures fit together very, very well. They should be the best of allies always. And it, so it's, it's sorrow to me to see a, a sort of a Muslim revivalist now in Turkey. And that's bound, that's bound to affect the feeling that the Greeks have for them. It's too bad. Was living as a writer overseas I mean, living overseas is different no matter what you do. But, but how did you find the life of a writer? I mean, I think a lot of us have a very romantic notion of, of <laughs> living as a writer overseas. You know, I mean, there's the Paris stereotype, yeah. right? That's 100 years old by now. But, but did you find that life as a writer was, uh, was different in, in just sort of a day-to-day -day way overseas from, from here at home? Of course, you weren't a fellowship, so that probably helped. But that meant I didn't have to go to work every day, except to my desk. Uh, no, Did you Mark, find Mark, that I, I know Mark will understand this and sympathize with this too, is that most practicing writers, unless they're working for a publication, have, they have a great need for space. And this was always one of uh, a long time ambition for several other people on the board at the Mechanics Institute, along with me, to carve out some workspace within the building on Post Street where writers could work that should have some space. Now, I know, Leslie, that, that you, Lizzie, that you are working sometimes at the Grotto, which is a, a, you know, an effort to produce some workspace for writers. Uh, I spent much of my time here in San Francisco with three kids in the house in the back room of a real estate office or in the, in the dining room with some friends. Uh, I was in a church for a while and <laughs> I was in someone's mountain cabin for a while because one simply has to uh, have a little, little place to be quiet, to work, yes. put your typewriter or now your computer up. And that's one of the other things, of course, that the Mechanics Institute now can offer mm -hmm. is a, I wish we had more space of that kind of the mechanic where people could leave their things behind and have them say a locker, even, even better, a room in which they could have a desk. We tried to do this. The space is usually has been uh, taken down there, but uh, particularly with the late uh, Rosemary Patton as a member of the board, we had campaigned constantly for a writer's center. There are such centers in many other cities and mm -hmm. frequently the writer gets a fellowship to be there for six months mm -hmm. or pays for the space. So well, that's still, that kind of and, that, and, that's still, and that's still a possibility for, you know, for something, something we can do. I know I, I have many colleagues at the Grotto actually who are also very active members at MI and who work both places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, these days we're all we're work we're work we can't go work at MI or at um, <laughs> or at the Grotto. We're we're all we all have I don't know about it. Well, I don't have small children. I suppose if I had kids at home, it would be different. But mm -hmm. it's there's sometimes it feels like there's a little too much space. Mark, did you particularly? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask uh, Mark the question, and I know that because. Uh, you were on the board uh, most of the time that Rosemary and I and some others were pushing for that writing center. 
the the inhibition seemed to me usually just that we needed the space for revenue. Wasn't that really the big problem? There's always a conflict, and, and any time we dedicate a, a, a specific space, it's it's it takes away revenue. But I was I was along the lines of what you wanted to accomplish. I was all for it, but uh, the, the economic situation at the time didn't permit it. And now things are a little bit different. I think, you know, I, I foresee something that we could have the space and maybe raise money for an annual grant uh, within the VMI community to sponsor a particular mm -hmm. writer. And that's a goal. And it's something that I would love to see happen. A writer uh, in residence. Yeah, writer in residence. It's just uh, in, residence. in the current circumstances, uh, it's very hard to predict any time going forward until further notice. So but that's something that I would like to accomplish uh, before it's all said and done. Uh, it's just a question of getting the, uh, the space and, and the money to supply the grant or the fellowship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it's something we should work on, definitely. Yeah. So Dick, you always worked, it sounds like you always found a place away from home to work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, it was that to have that physical division, you know, to be able to sort of have your workspace that was where you could just dedicate to whatever project you were immersed in and, and to be able at the end of the day to close the door and leave it. Yes. Yeah. Cause well, I think I, I was over a pizzeria on Clement street uh, for a while. I was in the back office of a realtor's office on Noriega Street. The trouble with the realtor, he, he was he was out of the office all the time, but he'd come in about five and want to talk. Uh -oh. <laughs> and Not by, by then I was just beginning to get up ahead of steam and get, get my bit of my right. bit of writing done for the day. Right. Along those lines, when do you find uh, you're most productive as far as writing goes? That you're both writers. When is there a certain time of day that works better or is it just kind of random that you get you get the uh, inspiration and you start writing whenever or is there a certain time of day that you're at your best as far as writing goes well, well if you, you wait know, think if it, you it, wait it, for it inspiration be, you know oh, i was just going to quickly say if you wait for inspiration you'll be waiting a long time <laughs> right. you got to you got to get your butt in the chair every yeah. day i work <laughs> in the morning that's my yeah. best time but what about you dick What's your best time to write, Dick? Uh, I, th I think uh, there. I think it was a French writer who said uh, the best place to write is to you know is to place your backside in in front of your desk, and and then write. Uh, what I find best for me to do is to have uh, broken off writing with something still to say. And perhaps you can make a note to yourself to kick you over uh, the next day. Yes. I even do that about what I'm going to cook the next day now. So I, 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 I wake up without any ideas. So well, you know, that was, something from yesterday was very good. That was Hemingway's trick. I remember reading somewhere that he would, he would leave with the sentence unfinished so that the next morning, he just had to he had to finish the sentence and then he was on a roll and i think there's a i think there's a lot to that i think um leaving you know i mean when it's going well you want to stay and keep it going well but but you if you're in a regular practice i've found if you're writing in a regular regular basis in a serious way maybe it's not every day but you know four or five days a week you um you you get into that that groove i mean certainly there are some days where it's more difficult annie dillard you know who writes wonderful books about natural history and about the Pil pilgrim at tinker creek and books like that annie dillard said what if the muse showed up and i wasn't there you know so in in terms of you know keeping yourself in your seat every day Dick, one question I wanted to ask you is, you know, writing, I don't think writing has changed, of course not, but I think the writing life has changed a lot in the last, over the last decades. You know, you mentioned earlier the idea that writing can be taught or writing at schools. 
and there's a much bigger emphasis now. There are many more MFA programs, many more graduate programs in creative writing than there were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, how, in, in your life as a writer, what do you see as sort of the biggest changes in, in the life of the writer or the, the world around the writer? I mean, I think, I think, as you say, it's all about sitting in the chair and writing. But in terms, of, in terms of the things we have to be aware of, the things we have to be cognizant of, the challenges. Well, I, I think the screen. Uh, the screen. The screen. Uh, yeah. You know, it, 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 it first began to change writing with the, with the growth of, of movies with plots in the 1920s or earlier. That became the most desirable medium for a writer was to be in movies. And if he could get there only by writing a book and adapting it to be the way. I think they were very, very different. And it's odd, odd to think that Heming, that uh, Faulkner, for example, was the author of, a, of, a, of an Egyptian thriller about the building of the pyramids, uh, you know, at, at, with screen credits. Now, you expect certain writers very much had screen in mind. And you know, I think that anybody writing about detectives in Hollywood <laughs> like Chandler, for example. David Chandler, yeah. They yes, had screen in mind. mind. And I think screen is in mind and still is now even more for television. And it's being affected very, very much by sort of reality TV, where you expect the, the drama to develop out of living people before your very eyes. These have got to be some of the influences on a writer's life. He's not going to be writing dialogue, every word of dialogue for people anymore, it's more likely that it may spring from them wonderfully. Mm. Mm. I, I can't like, do that. I don't I'm like to do that. What are you that. reading now and who's your favorite author? I'm just out of curiosity. If you have one favorite author, is there a genre that you really like to read? Yeah, well this, uh, actually my, my two favorite authors are very, are very demanding. One is Joseph Conrad. He, Conrad is hard to read. I think that Conrad's book Nostromo is one of the best novels ever written, but it's a dynamite book to read. It's tough. Graham Greene, mm. like tremendously. And then of all, Isaac Bobel, a Russian writer who, you know, he's a guy who, like Chekhov, I think it was Chekhov who said, a really good writer can break your heart with, with a period, with a, you know, with a period at the end of, of a sentence. And that meant restraint, that meant, and Bubble is fantastic about this. I mean, this is really a brilliant writer. I wish I could read Russian so I could read him in Russian. Yes, and his stories. And, uh, are so and my other, my, my one of my favorites currently. Well, I guess I mentioned uh, Craig Green, but uh, currently, uh, I think that some of the people breaking away from entirely from Hemingway are probably the ones I like. That I think that Hemingway was up to a point a very very great writer, but like Faulkner. He really not imitated very well, or imitated too much, and certainly imitating Faulkner is a dreadful way to go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's hard not to pick a favorite writer, and I think it's a it's a it's a great question. What's your favorite writer, Mark? Well, I mentioned Raymond Chandler. I love his stuff, but unfortunately, there's not that much material that he wrote. He only had like six novels, you know, a couple short stories. But I love his stuff, and I love that genre. Um, and I, I'm a big science fiction fan as well. But that's uh, you know, uh, Phil K. Dick I like a lot, but he was you know half crazy. But that's kind of what the appeal is. Yeah. Now the other one that I read almost almost incessantly, I have one of his books going all the time, was George Simenon, uh, oh. out of Inspector My Gray, and and his novels, uh, which are 
I have a particular reason because with my family, I lived in Switzerland in a little town and George Simonon was our neighbor. And my wife lovingly said, well, go, go say hello to Mr. Simonon, Dick, you're a writer. He'd love you to come over and say, I'm a writer, Mr. Simonon. I said, Mr. Simonon would write up, very likely have me shot <laughs> as I was fleeing out the Simonon's house had, had a, a wall around it like this and no underpinning or anything. It was a terror house. And I was not about to go and see Simonon, but I read him. I, you know, I, I've always got one Inspector Mygrave book. Uh, and they, they usually take about half a day to read, but I love them. Dick, can you talk a little bit about some of the books that you've written, and, and uh, particularly one that interests me about the rail, the railroads, and name your some of the travels that you had on the rails that inspired you to write that. And, uh, you know, what motivated you to write some of the books that you did write? You know, oh, go down okay. the list, but the one about the rails, what 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 got you started on that? Well, I was handed a book uh, by a, a friend of mine, uh, and. Uh, he suggested a book that we called Out West on the Overland Train, which we had a lot of pictures that were done by Frank, Frank, Frank Leslie's magazine in the 1870s or so about a trip across the country. And so I made the same trip and interlarded my impressions with each chapter. But doing that, I, I, I began to read a lot about railroads. So that so then I began to gather a lot of stories by people involved in the railroad, and that came into a book that was called Working on the Railroad. It's the only book I've written that's actually in print now. You buy it from Amazon. <laughs> they don't have it on the table, but they do sell it. I know we have um, a bunch of questions people want to ask, but before we open it up wider, I want to ask you, Dick, what do you... What book have you most enjoyed working on and why? A book called Treasure Island, which is a memoir of what it was like to be a kid in the Bay Area at the age of 11, when the whole Bay Area was just enchanted with the idea that we were going to have a fair here. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful fair. And uh, But the, the book is about, in a sense, it is it's almost like a memoir because the what happened at the fair uh, was what happens at all expositions it opened it ran along and then it closed closed <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know that's sort of like going to the legislature and reporting that the legislature did that whereas what the impression that it made upon us in our naive ways oh. uh and with a war breaking out in Europe, was it was such a juxtaposition of emotions there that by the time the fair closed, people were beginning to look over their shoulder, and it wasn't very long. I mean, actually, the war had broken out in Europe before the fair was over. So it was, uh, in that sense, it was sort of a heartbreaking uh, last look at what what we'd been before that yeah. time. Yeah, that's interesting to hear you say that because my mother remembered going. She went when she was about nine and she talked about it in much the same terms. So was was that the book you, let's see, you wrote that in 1973. Was that what kind of got you interested in historical preservation or had you been, had you had that already been an interest? Because I know that's a great interest of yours now. Uh, yes. But I have to say that uh, it was local issues of planning and preservation that I covered when I was a reporter on the Chronicle that really got me interested mm -hmm. in the idea of historic preservation mm -hmm. because it was involved in issues uh, like redevelopment and so forth. Uh, the, the first significant work I did for the Chronicle was about the impact that the use of the redevelopment law was having upon the black people of Richmond, California, who had come in as people to work in war industries there and were being systematically driven out of the city by the old the old white leadership. It was a 
very, very disturbing thing. And many, many goodwill people, uh, Catholic missionaries and Quakers and so forth, were the ones who blew the whistle on this. And I went over as a reporter on the Chronicle and found that it was true. The city government was using redevelopment to drive black people out of the wow. out of the town. And it was it was it was shocking and, and horrible and illuminating. But also that's when uh, I became interested in issues of that kind that involved land use as it affected people and housing as it affected people, things of that kind that were mm -hmm. underneath that lay underneath a kind of reporting that one would, you know, essentially run into a fire. Uh, that we call it was, it was newspaper report. It was deeper. We had to look at at trends, and we had to look at at the dangers to our society that were constantly there, and I think are constantly with us now. I, I think reporting is really much harder for anybody to do now because you have the instant instant competition of the net. Uh, you know, we could we couldn't have worked that fast. I could never have. As a reporter during those times, uh, you were going against the grain of the of the polit politicians. Did you ever feel that that you were ever threatened or in danger by reporting the, the truth? No, I didn't because I felt I was working for a good paper. The Chronicle at that time was it was very conservative politically, but they also, uh, if you wrote something and. Someone argued with her, as I did once. I wrote, I wrote something and attributed it to the governor, Goodman J. Knight. And uh, it was said when another reporter who had been at a meeting had already left. And Mr. Knight the next day said, he said, I didn't say that. And, but my editor, Mr. Kronika, said, no, Mr. Ryder says you did say that. <laughs> so they stood up for me. So I felt, you know, that if, if I once got it past the editor, that I could count on the paper supporting me, and uh, I think you know, I think you'll find that still exists now. That that uh, some of the reporters that are really sticking their necks out yeah. need need the support of their editor or their publisher. Yeah, good 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 editor is very important. Well, we need to uh, I think we need to open up to our to our audience, but before we do. I want to um, just take a minute, first of all, to thank you so much for this, the great conversation and, you know, keep talking for hours. Um, but I also want to express on the behalf of Mechanics Institute and, and the Board of Trustees, our deep gratitude to you as trustee. And not everybody may know that you retired in May from 22 years. I can't <laughs> give this to you personally. Oh but I'm going to read it to you and we will send it to you. <laughs> Mechanics Institute, since 1954, in commemoration of his years of steadfast support and dedicated leadership as a trustee, we recognize and thank Richard Reinhardt for his service, commitment, friendship, and scholarship as the author of our sesquicentennial history. Dick's contributions and passion for the mission of our cultural and literary institution have shaped us all for the better. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. I, I, this, this is unexpected, uh, thank you. Appreciate You're it. very welcome and we'll be sending it to you in the mail so you can hang it on your wall. <laughs> oh gosh, I, since I, there's no library for me to come into these days. I, I see some it. space, I see some space right behind you where you could put it. Yeah. So, okay. Um, Pam, you want to you want to do the questions? Yes, I just um, everybody should um, if you have a question, please um, go into the chat and type it there, and I will read I will read out some of the questions. First one is from George Hammond. Uh, it's a question for Mr. Reinhardt. Do you enjoy writing books, or um, is writing journalism more enjoyable for you? Oh, th th thank you, George. <laughs> Yeah, for the question and and uh, uh, books, books because they're somehow more lasting. And and uh, I, I'm a book lover. I have three unfinished or need to be revised novels in my office with me right now. 
and uh, I, I go to them with pleasure. So um, the next question is from Patrick Wolf. Um, he's asking um, what you, if there anything about in your books that you might change, um, could you talk quickly about some of the books you wrote and what inspired, you, why you wrote each one and what you thought went well? What's, what are you proud of about them? Oh, God. It's ringing even I can. How can it continue to rain when I took it apart? It's okay. We can't. It's, it's not that loud. Not Don't intrusive. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I would. I would. I'd, I'd use a whole lot fewer words in writing The Ashes of Smyrna. It, it, was, it was a long, long manuscript. I became enchanted with my research. Uh, this is somebody yeah. asking me to contribute something to something. <laughs> They don't know how stingy I am. <laughs> they call me stop this hour of the day. Uh, no, the question is, I really feel at the age that I wrote that thing, Ned later, my cousin. <laughs> so, so uh, I would use, I would have, have probably cut a certain amount of detail because I was, you know, I was enchanted with the results of my very heavy research in four languages. I mean four languages because I used French and Italian and English and Greek and Turkish as sources. Well, it's very hard to give that up. And that's one thing I would certainly change is I cut it down a whole lot. Another, let, me, let me just ask him a quick follow-up question. Did your editor try to get you to cut some and you didn't want to, or was that not even up for discussion? Uh, I, I had a wonderful editor who was willing for me to do a major revise. Uh, unfortunately, that editor who had been with Harper uh, moved over to another publisher and I had a literary agent then who said don't move with the editor mm. which was fortunate because he died later on mm. so I got a new editor who was very kind and uh, who guided me in getting rid of a superfluous character mm. and he was a superfluous character because I had killed him off rather early in the book <laughs> <laughs> but the editor said this Tolstoy could do that, Reinhardt can't. <laughs> As you may remember in War and Peace, one of the main characters is killed rather early in War and Peace in that great long book. So he said, Tolstoy, yes, Reinhardt, no. You already get to do that. So I had, I had revisions of that kind. So um, Jean Blaney is asking, um, what can we do to support budding writers in the current environment? I want to say, hi, Jean. She's a former, a former member of the board of the mechanics. What was your question, Jean? I'm sorry. It's, um, what can we do to support budding writers in the current environment? Have a, have a good writing room for them and some scholarships to the Mechanics Institute. <laughs> okay. And I would add to that, but, um, support local bookstores, support independent bookstores, go to readings. I have a lot of colleagues who have books coming out right now and, you know, right in the middle of a pandemic, who's going to go to a bookstore? But it's amazing what a lot of the stores and what we at MI are doing to, to promote and, you know, new books coming out. So I definitely agree with Dick about the scholarships for a writer's room at the MI, but, but just by, by supporting and reading, reading new writers. Pam, you're muted. It looks as though that's um, 
pretty much all of the questions unless somebody has something else they would like to ask. Um, I will, I do have a question. Are there books about writing, Dick, that you would, that you would recommend to writers? Oh, yes. Uh, and I think every, every writer will know this book, which is Strunk and White. E.B. White and Will Strunk, a famous book that uh, White revised uh, when he was a brilliant writer and editor for The New Yorker. And I think most most people who have had, <laughs> who have had any kind of, a, of, a, of an English course in a higher institution, and probably even in high school, would read Strunk and White. There it Which is, I, for those who, the yeah. elements of style. Right. Other than that, I read an absolutely charming book by Eudora Welty, a Southern writer. And I think that her biography and other biographies of that kind uh, that are, are really full of a certain tenderness about their subject matter. Eudora Welty wrote very tenderly about her subjects. And it's something to read you know, and, and not decide you're going to be such a smart ass that you're going to uh, introduce people to nasty people or get nasty things off your own chest, that you might think this is a humane art, you know, writing should be. It could be a terrible weapon, as we know. But I think if you want to, if you want to be a humanitarian yourself, you don't have to be religious about it, but you have to have some sympathy for other human beings before you start writing about it. Um, and one yeah. more question, question from George Hammond. You have three incomplete novels in your office. Which one do you intend to finish first? And what is it about? <laughs> oh, that, that's a hard one. Well, the, the, the first one is about, it's about a gold rush in southern, uh, southwestern Nevada in 1907. And it fascinated me because it was the scene of a terribly corrupt but famous boxing match between a black man and a white man. Mm -hmm. And it was also where everybody who had made money in the Klondike came and gambled and gambled away the money they had the Klondike. And it was visited by one of the most interesting literary women I've ever encountered, which whose name was Eleanor Glynn. And she was the author of the sexiest novel published in her time, which was called Three Weeks. And it was about a middle-aged woman and a younger man. Oh, boy, did they gobble it up. Anyway, Eleanor was there for the fight. And I thought she was just a great character. And that book is really finished. I wrote it from the point of view of three different characters. And I never could get anybody interested in buying it and publishing it. So I abandoned it. The other one is about, and to answer George's question, uh, is about a couple of men in the Bay Area who throughout their lives have been very good friends. And one of the men has had a little black spot in his life, which he has concealed. He can't, he's a guy who can't tell a lie. And, and uh, it, it, the story is really about the persistence and ultimately kind of the breakup of their lifelong friendship uh, over the secret that one of them will not share with the other. And that's, uh, that's the one that gets, good, that gets done next. <laughs> what did I say there were three? I guess that's... Are you still working actively? There must be another one around. Are you still working actively on, on any of them? Yes, yes. In fact, I've changed the name of one of them already. <laughs> That's how active it is. Yeah, yeah I am working on them. And uh, that's here. You know. Would you ever consider self-publishing? Since an old guy, now I lack, I, I lack a lot of energy. So I, after after I've been writing for a while, I think, gee, it's time for me to have a drink or go to bed <laughs> That's very common in the writing life, <laughs> regardless of the age. I think you all, all know that, all of you. 
Well, that seems to wrap up the questions, unless anybody has anything else they'd like to ask. Um, I think this has been just a fascinating conversation, Dick, and, and thank you so much. Did you, I, did you tape it or something so I can, my son who's in, um, in England and didn't want to be up in the middle of the night, you can, can see it? Yes, it is, I think we, 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 it has been recorded, and I think we'll also have a link to it somewhere on the website so people can find it there as well. Yes. They, 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 they really need something else to do, I think. <laughs> It, it is being recorded and it, the video will be available on our YouTube channel, which is accessible from our homepage. Um, there's a little icon of YouTube, or you can search YouTube for Mechanics Institute and it'll pop up. But uh, does that happen? Thank all of you, all of you folks, but and particularly Mark, who thought of doing this and it kind of drove us all together to have this conversation, even though we couldn't get together in person. That's right. We were, we talked about meeting in Mountain Lake Park, didn't we? And then we decided that wouldn't be very practical. I'd you know, still yes, like to do exactly. That. Thank you, Mark. Because what was it? Maybe two months ago, you called and you said, "What if we did this?" And yeah, yeah. great idea. It's been it's been really wonderful. And thank you all for coming and for the good questions and. Um, you can i have the co i have the copy of the ashes of smyrna that belongs to the mechanics but as soon as i return it whoever, whoever wants to read it next can i was going to comment on your most recent a recent writing that i wrote a, a dirge, I think, which, uh, Lindsay, which was uh about you you, you labeled it as nonfiction, uh and it and sold it to a literary magazine called Cimarron. Which I guess is what is it in New New Mexico or North Texas? Cimarron, actually, they're based in Oklahoma. They're part of Oklahoma State. Yeah, Cimarron is a great novel of Edna Ferber. It's a good name. Ah. Anyway, uh, I liked it a whole lot, but I thought it was really very close to fiction, although you decided to label it nonfiction. Oh, it's 100% true, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, I say I'm afraid because it's, um, it was a very difficult piece to write. It's a piece of memoir and it's a piece about the uncle I never knew. I had an uncle who was a family secret, who was a taboo, who was never discussed because of mental illness. And I grew up with this fascination with this uncle, but I knew I could not ask my father about it. My father was a very gentle man, but he was also, a, could be volatile, not, not violent, but I just knew it was a taboo topic. And I wrote about it. And um, it was a difficult piece to read for, for reasons you, you understand, Dick, if you read it, but no, it's, it's not fiction. I'm glad my family was not so reticent about gossiping with one about one another. <laughs> Although we did, I did have a grandmother who, uh, she and my grandfather were very strict total, very strict uh, teetotalers. And I, there was a, there was a, a brother who had died an alcoholic. And it was something that I think there was alcoholism has has always been regarded as a sort of a of a curse i think for a lot of people because either it involves illness or addiction or or a weakness that you don't want to admit uh, and and uh, so i think that that haunted my family a little bit having that sort of family secret but yeah. that's the only one i can think of that we had that was where some members of of the family were trying to keep keep the family skeletons out of the out of the minds of their children well of course kids are very perceptive right so even if even i mean even if it's meant to be kept away and not mentioned kids pick up on stuff kids kids hear things or they just pick up on a certain energy when you know whenever anybody mentioned my father's brother it was sort of like what who 
you know, so you just, kids pick up on that. And, and being a writer like you, you know, you said you wrote your autobiography at seven. I wrote my first autobiography at 10. So <laughs> we do these things and, yeah. and we observe, you know, and, and when things haunt us, for lack of a better term, I don't think it's too strong to say this haunted, this really, well, haunted might be too strong, but this really made an impact on me. And I, and I needed to write about it as well as some other family, family stuff. So memoir writing is very different, as you know, from your Treasure Island book. Memoir writing is very different from fiction writing for me. I, I feel my voice is different in the two. I have a different voice. So I'll have to send you a short story so you can read some fiction. How about that? <laughs> yeah, do that. Okay, well, thank you again. And everyone stay safe. Have a good evening. Um, I wish we could all be in that balloon behind Mark. That looks so the so beautiful in the sunset. Um, but Pam, do you want to, or Taryn, are you still there? Do you want to sign us off? Um, I, Taryn, are you, are you the, you were the host, so. Well, hey, thanks everyone for coming out to honor <laughs> Dick Reinhardt and thanks uh, Mark and Lindsay for your um, fascinating commentary and questions. Um, there are a couple of people who raised their hands. If you had a last minute question that you could quickly ch type in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Um, otherwise, I think, I think we're ready to sign off and send Richard off to uh, bed or drinky poo, whichever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, if you have a question. I want to ask Taryn too. Taryn, you were working at one time on a biography of one of the most important founders of the Mechanics Institute. Yes, she was. Is your cooking along on that one? Oh, so many things get in the way, but I'm clicking along. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is some, really one of our most interesting citizens in a way in that he, he's, he's known to us mostly as having supplied the ropes on which the cable cars run. Whereas he had so many other wonderful involvements in San Francisco. He's one of our one of our great citizens, including kicking off the Mechanics Institute. So I hope that will I hope that one will appear. One of the good guys. It will at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he didn't exactly make it easy. So <laughs> all right. Here's, oh here's one question I see because it just popped up. You see it? Yes, Libby Toller asks, what have you learned, Dick, between then and now? <laughs> Which then is she talking about now? Uh, you know, to have some poetic license. <laughs> you can decide which then and which now. But <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, the, the then, uh, I, I, I was asked to do an alumni evening speech for a Stanford group, and I called it, if I knew then what I know now, or the other way around, if I knew now what I knew then. I thought I knew a hell of a lot when I was about a sophomore or so in college. And what I, what I learned was that I was not going to change the world, that, I, that the ideas that I had were mostly extraordinarily naive. I really believed that the United Nations was going to put an end to war. I believed that a sort of a Quaker morality was going to put an end to military involvement in, ed in everything. And I thought that uh, love and kindness were going to, was going to prevail. And I'm sorry to say I have been somewhat disappointed in that. Well, That's how I know now. <laughs> Let's all try to keep that innocent spark because that's what keeps things bearable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a great note to end on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank and, you. Uh, Thanks thank so you. much, Mark and Mark.